Lecture 22, World Wars and the Church. Metternich's plan for peace across Europe by maintaining a system of traditionally based checks and balances failed, and the world was caught up by a succession of wars. A few of them, including, of course, the two world wars, are as follows. World War I, 1914-1918, during which the apparitions at Fatima occurred, the Mexican Cristero War, 1926 and 1929, the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939, and finally World War II from 1939 to 1945. World War I radically transformed political boundaries by ending four empires, Austro-Hungarian, German, Ottoman, and Russian. World War II also greatly altered the political world. During the Mexican and Spanish Wars, as will be seen, Catholics were specifically targeted. After World War II, the United States became established as one of the two dominant world superpowers, the other being the Soviet Union. These two superpowers subtly fought with each other in what is known as the Cold War. Throughout these wars, including the Cold War, the Catholic Church fulfilled her mission as an agent of peace and reconciliation. During World War, World war I, Pope Benedict XV promoted peace, specifically in his 1914 encyclical Ad Beatissimi Apostolorum. Similarly, both Pius XI and Venerable Pius XII promoted peace before and during World War II. Pope St. John XXIII fulfilled the very meaning of the Latin-based word pontiff, which is the pontifex, by serving as a successful bridge builder during the war. The pontifex or pontiff means bridge. Pope St. John Paul II also greatly helped to bring an end to the Cold War and strongly spoke out against the atrocities of war. World War I, Pope Benedict XV and the Message of Fatima. World War I breaks out. In 1908, the Austro-Hungarian Empire annexed the former Ottoman territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Russian Empire and the Kingdom of Serbia became deeply resentful of this annexation. Tension between the two military alliances of the Entente powers, France, UK, and the Russia, and the Triple Alliance, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, later called the Central Powers, when other countries joined, reached a peak on June 28, 1914. On that day, the Austrian Archduke and heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, Franz Ferdinand, was assassinated in Sarajevo by a Serbian nationalist. The Austro-Hungarian Empire responded by issuing an ultimatum to the Kingdom of Serbia, which the Kingdom of Serbia refused to comply with. To make matters worse, the German Emperor, William II, crowned in 1888, aggressively approached foreign policy in his new course. According to Wilhelm, I quote, For ever and ever there will only be one true emperor in the world, and that is the German Kaiser. A month later, on July 28, 1914, the Austro-Hungarian Empire declared war against Serbia, leading to a war involving the German Empire and the Austro-Hungarian Empire against Britain, France, and the Empire of Russia. Between 1914 and 1915, the German Empire and Austro-Hungarian Empire were joined first by the Ottoman Empire, followed by Bulgaria. During this terrible world war, tens of millions of combatants and civilians were killed. It ended on November 11, 1918, Armistice Day. After the war, the four imperial powers the German Empire, the Russian Empire, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Ottoman Empire were dismantled and in part replaced by nation-states. In the midst of World War I, the Ottoman Empire began actively persecuting Christians living in modern-day Turkey. At first, under the 1915 Tekher Law, or Law of Deportation, Thousands of Armenians and others considered as non-desirable who are living in modern-day Turkey were deported. During this time, estimates the International Association of Genocide Scholars, one million Armenian Christians were murdered in modern-day Turkey. This genocide had been prepared in advance by decades of contempt shown to the Armenian Christians living in the Ottoman Empire. William Ramsey's 
first-hand description of the discrimination Armenian Christians experienced in the 1890s gives us insight into this pre-World War I time. And I quote, Turkish rule meant unutterable contempt. The Armenians and Greeks were dogs and pigs to be spat upon. If their shadow darkened a Turk to be outraged, to be the mats on which he wiped the mud from his feet, conceive the inevitable result of centuries of slavery, of subjection to insult and scorn, centuries in which nothing belonged to the Armenian, neither his property, his house, his life, his person, nor his family was sacred or safe from violence, capricious, unprovoked violence to resist which by violence meant death. Benedict the Fifteenth, Faith and Peace. Throughout the war and all its atrocities committed by both sides, Pope Benedict the Fifteenth promoted peace. In his 1914 encyclical Ad Beatissimi Apostolorum, issued on the on November first, Feast of All Saints, he asserted that only when people remember in faith that the goods of this world are passing and only the goods of heaven can make us happy, will nations be able to attain peace. Our Lady of Fatima, Faith and Peace The Blessed Mother, in her appearances at Fatima, Portugal, similarly affirmed that genuine peace will only be likely to occur when human beings remember that they were created not to be fulfilled by earthly goods, by earthly pleasures, but were created for heavenly goods that transcend this world. The details of the Fatima apparitions include the following. On the 13th day of six consecutive months in 1917, beginning on May 13th, it is believed that the Blessed Mother revealed herself to three children, Lucia dos Santos and her cousins Jancinta and Francisco Marto. In the transcript, I provide a few illustrations or pictures. One, the first picture, is printed on October 29, 1917, in the Portuguese newspaper Ilustratio Portuguese, which captures tens of thousands of people looking in awe during the October 13, 1917 miracle of the sun when the sun appeared to descend. In another Portuguese newspaper, O Seculo, dating October 17, 1917, Avelino de Almeida, in describing the miracle of the sun, reported, Before the astonished eyes of the crowd, whose attitude carries us back to biblical times, and who, full of terror, heads uncovered, gaze into the blue of the sky, the sun has trembled, and the sun has made some brusque movements, unprecedented and outside of all cosmic laws. The sun has danced according to the typical expression of the peasants. In one vision, containing the second secret, Mary warned Lucia dos Santos of another world war with the words, If people do not cease offending God, a worse one will break out during the, pontif pon during the papacy of Pius XI. On January 25, 1938, shortly before the outbreak of World War II, the great sign promised to Lucia by the Blessed Mother appeared in the form of an enormous aurora borealis across the sky of the Northern Hemisphere. War between the World Wars Before we examine World War II, we will look at two wars that took place after World War I and before World War II the mexican Cristero War and the Spanish Civil War. In both conflicts, Catholics were targeted by their governments. The mexican Cristero War, from 1826 to 1829. The Mexican Revolution that began in 1910 is the context in which the Cristero War occurred. In 1910, Mexico was ruled by President Porfirio Diaz. As a former military general, Diaz ruled in a highly centralized and autocratic manner that caused people to protest, especially the rural poor. Many of the poor, especially the native Mexican-Americans living in rural areas, became enraged when Diaz privatized indigenous lands, required landowners to possess formal legal titles, and invited in the French foreign mining company 
all in order to rapidly industrialize and modernize Mexico. In order to ensure that he would win in the presidential elections of 1910, Diaz restricted free speech, was accused of rigging votes in his favor, and had his opponent Francisco Madero arrested and put in jail. After escaping from jail, Madero, with the help of General Pancho Villa and other notable revolutionaries, led a revolt that overthrew Diaz. In 1911, new elections were held. During these elections, Madero won over the rural poor vote by promising agrarian reforms. Their votes enabled him to win the election and to become Mexico's president. A few years later, in 1913, General Huerta, whom Madero had appointed commander of the army, led a revolt and that overthrew Madero, and in the process, Madero was killed. Huerta's presidency only lasted about a year, from 1913 to 1914. In 1914, the leadership of the country changed when Carranza, who was a Madero supporter and a supporter of agrarian reforms, overthrew Huerta and became Mexico's new president. At first, the prominent leader of Mexico's rural poor revolution, Zapata, supported Carranza. Later, though, Zapata turned on Carranza, fought Carranza's forces, and was killed in 1919. In turn, Carranza was assassinated in 1920. During Carranza's presidency, the 1917 anti-Catholic Mexican Constitution was signed into law. According to Article 3, all Mexican education is to be secular and non-religious. This meant that Catholic schools were prohibited from functioning. In addition, monasteries were also prohibited. These anti-religious aspects of the Constitution enraged many but other parts of the Constitution won over significant support, especially among the poor. For example, the Constitution protected workers by insisting on only an eight-hour workday, by forbidding child labor, by protecting female workers, by establishing a minimum wage, by mandating the institution of boards of arbitration, by mandating holidays, and by requiring termination compensation be given to workers. President Carranza was succeeded briefly by the interim president, Felipe Adolfo de la Huerta Marcor. After Marcor's brief six-month stint, President Obregón Salido, a military commander who turned on Carranza, became president and ruled until 1924. Obregón, who was assassinated during the Cristero War in 1928, was in turn succeeded by a staunchly anti-Catholic president, Plutarco Calles. As president, Calles strongly enforced the anti-Catholic articles of Mexico's constitution. According to Calles, the Catholic Church was an oppressive institution that stood in the way of progress, redistribution of wealth, social justice, labor rights, and democracy. Along with the 1917 constitution, Calles used this anti-Catholic rhetoric to justify his seizure of church property, the expulsion of foreign priests, and the closing down of religious schools, convents, and monasteries. Not surprisingly, it was during Calle's presidency in 1926 that the two-year Cristero War broke out. During this war, when Catholics banded together to fight their government, tens of thousands of people were killed, including the well-known Jesuit priest Blessed Miguel Pro. Blessed Miguel Pro was executed by the government on November 23, 1927 on false charges of having attempted to assassinate the former president Obregón. Before being killed, Miguel Pro cried out, Long live Christ the King! Viva Cristo Rey! The end of the Cristero War in 1929 did not bring an end to Catholic persecution by the Mexican government. One notable example was the horrific abuse the Catholics suffered under the governor of the state of Tabasco, Thomas Garrido Canabal, who ruled from 1922 to 1926 and from 1931 to 1934. Canabal was a member of the Marxist-oriented Radical Socialist Party of Tabasco. Under his leadership, all Tabasco priests were, were required to marry, many priests and Catholic faithful were killed, and churches were destroyed. He is also known for naming his son Lenin 
a bull god, a donkey Christ, a cow the Virgin Guadalupe, an ox and a hog Pope, and a nephew and a nephew Lucifer. It was during Cannibal's second term that Pope Pius XI, in his 1932 encyclical Acerbi Animi, condemned Catholic persecution in Mexico. Not until 1992 did the Mexican government finally amend its constitution regarding religious freedom. According to the current amended constitution, Catholic clerics and religious have legal status, may vote, religious and clerics may also own property, and students may be instructed in religion in private schools. The Spanish Civil War, from 1936 to 1939. The Spanish Civil War is best understood in its historical context. In 1923, General Miguel Primo de Rivera seized power, named himself head of the government, while allowing King Alfonso III to remain as the relatively symbolic head of state. There was hope that this reform-minded general would end political rep corruption. However, after losing much public confidence, the support of the military and the support of key industrialist leaders in 1930, Rivera resigned. King Alfonso III then requested that another general, Damaso Berenguer, lead the country as head of government. After Berenguer's government foundered, foundered, King Alfonso III left Spain in order to avoid being removed forcefully. That same year, in April of 1931, after a new set of elections, a provisional anti-monarchical government was drawn up, headed by Zamora. Near the end of 1931, radical leftist and socialist friendly Manuel Azana Diaz became the first prime minister of the Second Spanish Republic and Alcala Zamora was elected and he was elected president. Azana's political views led him and others to falsely define the Catholic Church as an oppressive institution. For this reason, according to Spain's 1931 Constitution, Article 26, Spain's clerical budget was to end in two years' time. Religious orders, whose activities constitute a danger to the security of the state, that's a quote, were banned, and the property of Catholic religious orders were subject to nationalization. The Second Republic's intent to radically restructure Spain including its religious affiliation to Catholicism, caused an uprising led, led by General Francisco Franco. In 1936, General Franco led his rebel nationalist forces in a war against Spain's Second Republic. The Socialist Republicans were supported by the Soviet Union. The Nationalists, on the other hand, received support from both Nazi Germany and from Fascist Italy. On the 1st of April 1939, the Nationalists decisively defeated the Republicans. Franco then ruled Spain for 36 years, from 1939 to 1975, the year of his death. During this horrific civil war, the Catholic Church repeatedly faced the Republicans' destructive rage. Although the Nationalists were friendly towards the Catholic Church and protected the Church from the Republicans, they also were responsible for unjustifiable violent acts. In 2007, Pope Benedict XVI recognized 498 Spanish Catholic martyrs of this terrible civil war by beatifying them. These martyrs account only for a fraction of Catholics who were savagely killed by the Republicans. According to careful research done by Montero, during Spain's Red Terror, at least 6,832 clergy and religious were murdered by the Republican forces. In the Diocese of Barbastro, the Republican forces killed 88% of the diocesan clergy. World War II During the same year that Spain's civil war ended, the world became enmeshed in World War II. A cause, among others, of World War II was the 1919 Treaty of Versailles that Germany was required to sign at the end of World War I. It was not, of course, the intention of those who had made the treaty to bring about another world war. On the contrary, a peacekeeping league called the League of Nations, which the UN founded in 1945 to prevent World War III, uh, is a further development of, was written into the Treaty of Versailles. 
as demanded by the U.S. President Woodrow Wilson and reflected in the treaty, a general association of nations must be formed under specific covenants for the purpose of affording mutual guarantees of political independence and territorial integrity to great and small states alike. The primary difficulty that the League of Nations faced was how to enforce peace even if member states submit their disputes to the League of Nations as the arbitrator. In addition, if the League of Nations did have the military power to enforce its decisions, would such a concentration of power in a supranational body be prudent? As Lord Acton warned, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. War Guilt Clause Despite President Wilson's good intentions, there was a section of the treaty that instead of increasing stability in Europe helped to further destabilize Europe, in particular Germany, due to its excessive demands. According to Article 231 of the Versailles Treaty, known as the War Guilt Clause, I quote, the Allied and Associated Governments affirm and Germany accepts the responsibility of Germany and her allies for causing all the loss and damage to which the Allied and Associated Governments and their nationals have been subjected as a consequence of the war imposed upon them by the aggression of Germany and her allies. By signing the treaty, Germany agreed to disarm, admitted it was responsible for causing World War I, promised to pay a significant amount of money in reparation, for having caused the war and gave over territory to the victors. To meet the required payments, Germany began borrowing. This in part caused German inflation in the 1920s to rapidly spiral out of control. As vividly described by Eric T. Weitz, and I quote, by the end of November 1923, a single U.S. dollar bought 4.2 trillion marks. Germans carried suitcases and pushed wheelbarrows full of money to buy a loaf of bread or a pair of shoes. They swarmed over the countryside and railroad yards like biblical gleaners or latter-day thieves, gathering potatoes that had been left behind in the field or coal that had fallen off train cars. Or they dismantled fences and took the wood for heating. When the stock market crashed in 1929, Germany's reparation payments were finally suspended. They resumed in 1953. Not until October 3, 2010, did Germany finally pay back its reparation payments. The rapid inflation that people in Germany had experienced caused many of them to want strong leaders who would bring an end to what they perceived as unjust demands imposed upon their country. The political group that more and more Germans began looking towards with hope was, unfortunately, the Nationalist Socialist Party, otherwise known as the Nazis. Appeasement Policy Another possible major factor for creating an environment conducive towards a world war was not another set of harsh measures, but precisely the opposite, represented in the policy called appeasement. According to the policy of appeasement, which would supposedly avoid another world war, countries were willing to make concessions to a dictatorial power, even if this meant recognizing the illegitimate taking of territory. The British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was a principal proponent of this policy and acted according to this policy when dealing with Nazi Germany in the late 1930s. When in October 1938, Adolf Hitler insisted on taking Germany sorry, insisting, insisted on, on that Germany take the Sudetenland, German name for areas in Czechoslovakia with a German majority, Chamberlain appeased Hitler by agreeing to his demands. Supported by the French government, Chamberlain told the Czech president to give in to Hitler's demands for there to be peace. In hindsight, it does not appear that the policy of appeasement was an effective way of ensuring peace, but rather further emboldened dictators such as Hitler to be even more insistent in their demands while building up their military to take what they want when it is not given to them. On May 10, 1940, Chamberlain resigned and was replaced by Winston Churchill, who served as Britain's Prime Minister from 1940 to 1945, and from 1951 to 1955. During Chamberlain's term as Prime Minister, 
Churchill had been very vocal in warning about the dangers associated with the policy of appeasement. He instead urged Britain to rearm and prepare for war, not for war's sake, but for greater peace and justice in the future. On September 1, 1939, Germany invaded Poland and France declared war on Germany. World War II had begun. The two opposing military alliances were the Allies and the Axis powers. Not all the countries involved in World War II had allied themselves when war officially broke out. For example, Italy did not join the Axis powers until 1937, and the USA did not join the Allies until Hawaii's Pearl Harbor was bombed by the Japanese on December 7, 1941. Several months earlier, in June of 1941, Germany, under Hitler's leadership, invaded the Soviet Union. This proved to be an error on the part of Germany, since by invading the USSR, it overstretched itself similarly as Napoleon had done so when he invaded Russia in 1812. Around a year later, in 1942, the Axis powers' advance was halted by the Allies. The war, though, still dragged on, even after D-Day of June 6, 1944, when the Allies successfully landed on the beaches of Normandy, France. Finally, on May 8, 1945, Germany unconditionally surrendered, and on August 15, 1945, Japan surrendered after being bombed with nuclear weapons by the U.S. In 1985, Pope St. John Paul II strongly condemned the dropping of nuclear weapons on the civilians of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Pius XI and Pius XII in relationship to World War II. Now that we have covered the essential facts of World War II, we will take a careful glance at how two popes approached World War II. Shortly before the Second World War, Pope Pius XI, in his 1937 German-written encyclical Meet Brennender Sorge, denounced Nazi anti-Semitism. This document was read from the pulpit in Germany's Catholic churches. He followed this in 1938 by arguing that anti-Semitism has no place in the Catholic Church, since spiritually we are Semites. Despite the popular perception that Pius XII at worst was a virulent anti-Semite and at best ignored the plight of the Jewish people during World War II, the historical facts prove that these two ways of seeing Pius XII are inaccurate. I'm going to first state, uh, I'm going to go through and dispel a number of myths regarding Pius XII as an anti-Semite. 1. Pius XII acted diplomatically in order to save more lives. More lives. On May 13, 1940, Pius XI, in audience with Italy's Ambassador Dino Alfieri, asserted, The Italians are certainly aware of the terrible things taking place in Poland. We might have an obligation to utter <coughs> fiery words against such things, yet all this is holding us back from doing so is the knowledge that if we should speak, we would simply worsen the predicament of these unfortunate people. In October 2014, in the October 2014 International Conference in Rome on Pope Pius XII, Dr. Limor Yagen of the University of Paris argued that Pius XII, as is evident above, chose not to directly denounce Nazi action so that he could more effectively save lives behind the scenes. According to the papers of a former CIA director, Alan Dulles, Pius XII was warned by the U.S. not to outwardly condemn Hitler. The fear was that if Pius XII did so, Hitler would retaliate in terrible ways. Despite being cautioned and his own caution in his 1942 Christmas message, Pius XII publicly denounced ethnic cleansing, which included the Nazi systematic murder of the Jewish people, and I quote, Should they, rather, vow not to rest until in all people and all nations of the earth a vast legion shall be formed of these handfuls of men who bent on bringing back society to its center of gravity, which is the law of God, aspire to the service of the human person and of his common life ennobled in God. Mankind owes that vow to the hundreds of thousands of persons who, without any fault on their own part, 
sometimes only because of their nationality or race, have been consigned to death or to a slow decline. Number two, the New York Times repeatedly praises Pius XII, and this is an example. On Christmas Day, 1941, the New York Times stated, I quote, The voice of Pius XII is a lonely voice in the silence and darkness enveloping Europe this Christmas. End of quote. Three, the conversion of the chief rabbi of Rome. From 1939 to 1945, Israel Zoli served as Rome's chief rabbi. After the war, he converted to Catholicism, taking the name Eugenio, out of gratitude to Pope Pius XII. Israel's foreign minister praises Pope Pius XII. In 1958, after the death of Pope Pius XII, Golda Meir, as Israel's foreign minister, wrote the following, I quote, We share in the grief of humanity. When fearful martyrdom came to our people, the voice of the Pope was raised for its victims. The life of our times was enriched by a voice speaking out about great moral truths, about the tumult of daily conflict. We mourn a great servant of peace. Nazi newspaper denounces Pius XII. The day after Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli was elected Pope and assumed the name Pope Pius XII, the Nazi Berlin newspaper Morgan Post stated, and I quote, The election of Cardinal Pacelli is not accepted with favor in Germany because he was always opposed to Nazism and practically determined the policies of the Vatican under his predecessor. A former Russian KGB agent admits to character assassination. According to the former KGB agent, Ion Mihai Pachepa, in my other life, when I was at the center of Moscow's foreign intelligence wars, I myself was caught up in a deliberate Kremlin effort to smear the Vatican by portraying Pope Pius XII as a cold-hearted Nazi sympathizer. In February 1960, Nikita Khrushchev approved a super-secret plan for destroying the Vatican's moral authority in Western Europe. Pope Pius XII was selected as the KGB's main target. It's incarnation of evil, because he had departed this world in 1958. Dead men cannot defend themselves, was the KGB's latest slogan. Because Pius XII had served as the papal nuncio in Munich and Berlin when the Nazis were beginning their bid for power, the KGB wanted to depict him as an anti-Semite who had encouraged Hitler's Holocaust. The hitch was that the operation was not to give the least hint of Soviet bloc involvement. The whole dirty job had to be carried out by Western hands. Pius XII is slandered in the play The Deputy. As described by Inside the Vatican, and I quote, in order for the character assassination to be done by Western hands, the Soviets promoted and funded a play written by the West German Rolf Hockhoff under the direction of a communist producer, Erwin Piscator. In the play, Pius XII is portrayed as supporting Hitler's goal to murder all the Jewish people. This play was first shown in 1963 and greatly helped in spreading a misconception of Pius XII in relationship to the Nazis. End of quote. The 1989 book Hitler's Pope is published. In this book, John Cornwell continued the character assassination campaign by portraying Pope Pius XII as an anti-Semite. <coughs> the Cold War The Cold War. Shortly after World War II ended, there began another type of war called the Cold War that lasted to 1991 when the Soviet Union ended. During the Cold War, the United States and its allies and the USSR and its allies were in a constant state of tension. The great friction between these two countries led to a fast-paced arms race between these two superpowers. The constant fear during the Cold War was that some event or series of events would trigger a nuclear world war that would practically end human civilization. Pope St. John XXIII prepares the way for the end of the Cold War. John XXIII prepared the way for the end of the Cold War by reaching out to the Soviet Union leaders Nikita Khrushchev. As recounted by Archbishop Kapovilla, personal secretary of John XXIII, the Pope's ongoing dialogue with Khrushchev began in 1961, and I quote, It all began on the 25th November 1961. 
Roncalli had been Pope for three years and was celebrating his 80th birthday. While the Holy Father was having lunch, he received a telephone call. It was Cardinal Cicognani, Secretary of State, who asked if he could visit the Pope in his private apartment to deliver a very urgent message to him. I informed the Pope, who told me, to let him in. I met him and showed him to the dining room. The Secretary of State was carrying a message from the Soviet ambassador to Italy, Semen Kozrev. The message said, On behalf of Khrushchev, I have been entrusted with the task of communicating to His Holiness, Pope John XXIII, on the occasion of his 80th birthday, my congratulations and sincerest wishes for good health and success in the continuation of the noble aspiration of contributing to the strengthening and consolidation of peace on earth and the solution of international prob problems through candid pronouncements." End of quote. Those who doubted that dialogue with a committed communist leader would bring about anything positive were proven wrong, when in 1963 Kutrev, of his own initiative and out of his liking for John XXIII, freed Archbishop Slipyi. Slipyi had been imprisoned for Slipyi had been imprisoned in Siberia by the Soviets. John XXIII again proved the doubters wrong when he acted as the prime bridge builder between the U.S. and Soviet Union during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962. President Kennedy capitalized on Khrushchev's appreciation of John XXIII by requesting that the Pope serve as an unofficial mediator between the two superpowers. John XXIII graciously agreed and wrote a message of peace that was delivered to the U.S. and Soviet embassies. Both Khrushchev and President Kennedy responded back to John XXIII's plea for peace by assuring him that they also wanted peace and not war. Soon after, the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved. Pope St. John Paul II the Great helped to conclusively end the Cold War. As well argued by the self-identified agnostic liberal and British historian Timothy Garton Ash. Without John Paul II's role in encouraging as a Polish Pope Poland's 1980s solidarity movement, there would have not been a substantial reason for the Soviets to change their policy in Eastern Europe. Without this reason, the likelihood that the Soviet Union would relatively peacefully break up in 1991 would have been highly un unlikely. It is reasonable to conclude, therefore, that John Paul II was the key person in bringing about the dissolution of the Soviet Union through diplomatic, peaceful means. And this is what Timothy Garton Ash writes. I quote, No one can prove conclusively that John Paul II was a primary cause of the end of communism. However, the major figures on all sides, not just Lech Walesa, the Polish solidarity leader, but also solidarity's arch opponent, General Jaruzelski, not just the former American President George Bush Sr., but also the former Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, now agree that he was. I would argue the historical case in three steps. Without the Polish Pope, no solidarity revolution in Poland in 1980. Without solidarity, no dramatic change in Soviet policy towards Eastern Europe under Gorbachev. Without that change, no velvet revolutions in 1989. God bless.